where we are already in steel, we are, at least in North America, we don't use a lot of virgin ore. They still do in other parts of the world, like China, Australia, and Brazil pr provide ore, but that's partly because the, the growth of steel is still, steel, the use of steel is still growing. Um, to get us back together here, um, uh, well, we've done those two. I guess I could t give you the, I gave you the Future of Metals paper, okay. So I already handed out the Future of Metals paper, but let me just say something about the steel industry in general. I wrote this article in 1991 because I was sick of hearing the ceramists at the time were the big thing, and super high temperature superconductors. So this article came out in like 1991 or something in the Welding Journal. Probably the only people had guts to publish it. Um, but, um, and my point was, I hear them talking about, oh, fine ceramics was going to become a $30 billion a year industry. Well, whoop de do, okay? At the time, the steel industry was a $500 billion industry. You've already got a copy of this, okay? And fine ceramics was going to grow, it was, at that time, it was $5 billion and it was going to have an estimated annual growth rate of 20%. Composites, which were big because of Star Wars in the mid 80s, everybody's talking about composites. 15 billion growing to 10, at 10% a year. Semiconductors, 100 billion growing at 5% a year. And everybody was telling me how wonderful silicon was and everything else, uh, and fine ceramics and composites. And people were starting to say metals were dead. And I said, no, they're not. And I was sort of a voice crying in the wilderness about all this. And I said, yeah, it's true. Steel only grows at 2% a year in volume. But when you got a $500 billion base, it turns out the growth in steel is more than the growth of, of, growth of all of those others combined in dollar volume. So, and it turns out there were some people who understood that. There was this guy, Indi there was an Indian guy named Mittal. And he went around in the early 90s and late 80s buying up every steel company that all the boys on Wall Street wanted to get rid of. And he could buy them for two cents on the dollar. Now they had environmental problems and the legacies that they owned and things. But he worked out some of those things in the, in the sales and stuff. And all the, all the investors wanted to get rid of steel the, the steel stocks back then. And this guy Mittal in India went around buying them up. So today, some of the world's largest steel companies are ArcelorMittal, which is a French company that merged. But British Steel is now part of Mittal, okay? Um, uh, part of the, the best part of Bethlehem Steel, the, the Burns Harbor plant, which was the last main large-scale steel plant built by a, by a company in the world. Bethlehem Steel decided to build a brand new Greenfield Steel plant in 1965. And it turns out that uh, it almost ba bankrupt them. Okay, at the same time they decided to build the uh, Homer Research Labs for six hundred million dollars, which is where I was hired into in 1974. Um, it was six hundred million dollar research lab in like 1966 when they built it. It was a Taj Mahal, okay, of research labs. Bethlehem was the second largest steel company in the world um, at the time, after U.S. Steel. And how did U.S. Steel and Bethlehem get to be the first and second largest steel companies with so much market clout that in 1962, when U.S. Steel wanted to raise the price of steel, President Kennedy stood them down and made them roll back the prices. And the steel guys say, that's when we lost our profitability. But the reason they did, steel was like oil is today. The world's economy depended on the price of steel. Just like today, you, the price of oil controls uh, the world's economy. Before the 1973 oil embargo, when the price of oil started going up, steel was the commodity that controlled the world's economy. Okay, And U.S. Steel in Bethlehem controlled 75 percent of the world's steel production in 1945. Why? Because we had bombed out all the rest of the capacity. What a great thing! You have a war, you bomb out your competition! By 1975, when I was working at Bethlehem Steel, US, the U.S. had, US, let's, let's see, in 
1945, it was, the U.S. had 75% of the world's steel capacity, and U.S. and Bethlehem had like 60, or over 40% of the world's capacity between the two of them. By 75, which is only 30 years later, we had 25% of the world's steel making capacity. And I remember going to one of what they called the loop course, all the 500 new college grads uh, that had been bought, uh, hired by Bethlehem that year. And the vice president of finance got up and he told us that it co cost Bethlehem nothing to make steel because we had 1911 uh, Coke ovens and 1912 blast furnaces and they were fully depreciated. And I was stupid enough in the question and answer to raise my hand among these 500 new hires and say, how come it doesn't cost anything to make steel because you've got 1911 and 1912 equipment? Oh, you don't understand accounting. Well, you know, a year and a half later, I took an accounting course at Lehigh University, and I found, he's right, I didn't understand accounting, but I also learned he didn't understand accounting. Using old equipment doesn't make you more efficient, okay? And productivity is what's important, not whether your equipment's depreciated, okay? But he thought depreciation. That's why Bethlehem Steel no longer exists. That's why after 13 months I said, where do I want to be five years from now? And the clear answer was, not here. And that's when I came back to MIT. And now I say, where do I want to be five years from now? And actually I probably still want to be here, but I don't want to deal with, deal with the administration. Okay, that's another story. Okay, so um, there is this article on the future of metals. And it, it shocked people when I told them that the steel industry was five times the silicon industry in 1991. It's still five times the silicon industry, okay? It's bigger, but so is the silicon industry. But st we know more, more about the science of iron and steel than we do about any other material in the world, okay? We know a lot more about steel than we do about silicon. And so this is sort of like my little thing on corrosion. You're not going to be a corrosion expert after all of this, and you're not even really going to be a steel expert after all of this. Hopefully you have an idea of some of the things that go into trying to uh, weld some materials, and in particular steel is the one you're going to deal with the most. By the way, that 21st century uh, research uh, thing, the Defense Department w wanted to know what type of material they were going to use. The Army did a big study in the late 90s because, you know, you had these managers um, in the government and in, in industry and in the Wall Street Journal and everything saying, you know, the steel companies are dying, okay? Uh, and actually another th part of my future metals paper, did you know the productivity of manufacturing in the United States went up like 4% in the 1980s when the Japanese were killing us in the marketplace? We still had the highest productivity in the world in the United States per man hour, okay? It turns out the steel industry was double the manufacturing and the industry that was three times the average of manufacturing was the mining industry. And everybody said these industries were terrible because they were losing jobs. Well, when you have, you know, a doubling of productivity in 10 years, guess what happens, and, and not a super increase in consumption, guess what happens to jobs? They decrease. This is, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist economist to know that if your consumption is constant and your productivity doubles, your employment goes down by a factor of two. When I was in the steel industry in 1975, six person hours per ton, okay? By the mid-90s, it was half an hour per ton, six times better in 20 years. Today, it's less than 20 minutes a ton to make steel. If you go up to Saugus Ironworks, it was about 4,000 hours per ton, about two, one or two person years of effort, cutting down the trees, making the charcoal, smelting it, all to get a lousy ton of steel, or cast iron, it wasn't even steel, it's cast iron. So productivity in these industries has been tremendous you know, over this period of time. Why? Necessity is the mother of invention, okay? When you see that you're gonna be extinct, you're gonna lose your company, you start taking innovation. You start, you're willing to innovate. There's a lesson here for the US Navy. When was the last time you really innovated? Oh, sorry, okay. That's another story, I won't go into that, okay? There's a little conservatism, okay?
particularly in the submarine business, um, about innovation. But actually, we had a very good presentation about innovating in titanium yesterday, right? Uh, so you have to be careful about innovation. It can be a problem. Anyway, here is the phase diagram for steel. I'd ask you if you ever had seen anything, a phase diagram. Steel in the base, most ba basic form is just an alloy of iron and carbon. So here's iron, 100% going up in temperature, and here's you're adding carbon to it up to, this thing goes out to about 12% carbon, okay? And this is molten liquid up here. This is face-centered cubic non-magnetic steel up here. This is body-centered cubic down here. It turns out above uh, about 600 something it's actually non-magnetic body center cubic because you're above the Curie temperature. And they talk about this as being alpha iron or ferrite. You see the alpha iron right there? I mean, I can blow it up. This is gamma iron. What happened to beta iron? I used to teach this when I, to my sophomores. What happened to beta iron? Well, beta iron was the non-magnetic body center cubic form. Okay, there was a beta iron until the 1920s and x-ray diffraction came along and then um, uh, Marie Curie came along and explained that it, there is a phase transformation, but it's what we call second order phase transformation when it goes from ferromagnetic to non ferromagnetic. But you don't have to worry about that. There was a beta iron once, okay? But if I look at that same diagram, I can plot on here where different types of materials are. So for thousands of years, we used cast iron until Henry Bessemer. And that's because we will put charcoal and limestone and iron ore in this big furnace and we actually could melt it because carbon drops the melting point dramatically to below um, 1200 degrees centigrade. And I can melt that with a charcoal fire. I can't melt steel with at above 1500 degrees centigrade until Henry Bressmer taught me how to preheat the air coming in. But I could melt cast iron and so we had, we could melt cast iron up here at Silicus Iron Works and we could make little frying pans and kettles and things like that. They used to take, forge them, hand forged nails. Um, back in the old days, 400 years ago, they mostly used wooden pegs to build a house because most people couldn't afford nails. And in fact, when the house got old and uh, rotten, they sometimes would burn it down and then rake through the ashes to recover the nails. That's how, hey, at one person year per ton, you know, there was significant labor content to be gained uh, by recovering the nails in an old house. So these are cast irons at above three or three and a half percent carbon, and they melt at low temperatures. Then we have, at very high carbon, we have something called tool steels. And then we have high carbon steels. We also have medium carbon steels in here, but I didn't want to crowd it. And then in yellow here, the yellow highlighter, we have low carbon steels. This is what we weld, are low carbon steels. Because carbon, although it strengthens steels, it lowers the melting points, it can do really bad things when you can't control the solidification, okay? What steel is a very important material, just like clay was a very important material thousands of years ago, because you could take clay and you could, as a potter, you could shape it, make complex shapes uh, out of it, and they learned to make potter's wheels, you know, make circular shapes and stuff, get your hands all muddy, play in the mud as an adult. Um, and then you could fire it, and you could burn off all that water and stuff, and you could turn it into pottery, which is a brittle ceramic, Anyway, so, and you can make art things. Well, you can do the same thing to steel. I can take a piece of steel and I can harden it or I can leave it as, this is actually a medium carbon steel 1045. This is probably about 8 tenths of a percent carbon, typically right at the lowest uh, transformation temperature. And I can make one of them six or seven times harder than the other. And I have a file and I can, I can work, I can machine th this soft stuff I can heat it up and deform it. I can heat this up and deform it, but it's no longer going to be hard and strong, okay? So one of the great things about steel, and I wrote my humanities paper as a junior on the hardening of steel, taught by, and of course taught by one of the world's great metallurgists who became here from the University of Chicago when he retired at 65 and became an institute professor in humanities because he had studied also um, archeology span 
of materials. Uh, Cyril Smith, okay? Uh, so I took my humanities, one of my humanities courses to learn about the history of materials under Cyril Smith. But in any case, we have different types of steels. We have higher carbon tool steels that we can hot work steel, we can cold work steel, we can make very hard uh, tooling that allows us to form steel very rapidly and make sheet metal for automobiles. But the sheet metal for automobiles is always going to be a low carbon steel. Because we can have, we can adjust the carbon. The high carbon steels are going to be into things like files. Okay? We don't do a lot of high carbon steel. Medium carbon steels, when we need strength and we need it inexpensively, maybe in a pressure vessel or something, we might use uh, 0.35 carbon steel. But HY80 probably has a limit on carbon of 0.2. Okay? 0.2 is going to be. What do I do with my. Uh, 0.2 is going to be right down in there in the yellow. Okay? We really would prefer, in the HSLAs, we're down at 0.1. And the Japanese have developed some steels that are less than 0.02. But they're really expensive because they have to use a different form of manganese as an alloying element um, that doesn't have carbon in it. But in any case, um, I can make steels that are very, very low carbon. Uh, and they have some interesting properties. Uh, but because they're expensive, you have to make them the same way we make stainless steels. And so they're more expensive. Uh, but we can make them at very low carbon. By the way, um, just to tell another story, since I like, I'd rather tell, you don't ask very many questions. If you ask more questions, I could have more stories, right? I'd rather tell stories than, as you can tell, than uh, uh, go through my lecture notes. But uh, uh, the technology to make very, very low carbon steels, which is very important in the stainless steel industry, because carbon can destroy the, cr the uh, very much carbon in some cases can destroy the corrosion resistance of the stainless steel. And we'll talk about that later. But it turns out the technology to do that was invented in the basement of Building 8 here, okay, in the 1950s. Stainless steels were much more expensive than they are today. Um, it, it was basic science, and the guy, the graduate student who did his doctoral thesis on the carbon reaction and stuff um, basically went to work for a company and then applied it and changed the whole stainless steel industry. By the way, if you look at the bottom of this little diagram, the, the bottom has the name John Chipman. Okay. John Chipman was the head of this, the materials department here from 1945 to uh, 1962 when he was turned 65 and retired. Um, but John Chipman taught the world how to make reproducible steel. In the 1930s, 1940s, they might make five heats of steel and get four good ones with the right chemistry. In the 1920s, they might make two heats of steel to get one good one. Um, and they'd have to either reuse the steel for something else if they could, but they couldn't control the chemistry of the steel very well. John Chipman spent his career um, teaching people how to control the chemistry of steel. If we look at different types of steels, uh, there's lots of terms. There's cast iron versus cast steel. Uh, but you can have low carbon steel, which I've defined for you as less than about 0.2% carbon. Medium, these are not hard and fast definitions. But that's what people has just kind of called things over the years, over the last 100 years. Medium carbon steel, high carbon steels. High carbon steels are between about above 0.6. So somewhere between 0.3 and 0.6 is medium carbon. Mild steel is ill-defined. It's certainly all of the low carbon steels, but it's also some of the medium carbon steel. So mild steel might be up to 0.4 carbon, 0.5 carbon. There's hot rolled steel and cold rolled steel. And someone say, oh, that's a piece of cold rolled steel. Hot rolled steel, if I want to make plate, I got to heat it up. I can't take a 10 inch slab of steel and cold roll it, okay? I don't have mills that are big enough. In theory you could, but your, your mill stands would have to be 20 feet in diameter, okay, for the rolls. So you heat it up to 1200 degrees or 11 or 1200 degrees centigrade and you can hot roll it. At that point it's, well it's not soft as butter, but compared to what it was before it is soft as butter. It's much softer 
and you can squeeze it, extrude it. Um, not that we do a lot of extrusion of steel, but just like squirting toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube. If you get it to 11, 1200 you, and you have a big enough hydraulic ram, you can squeeze it out. Once you get below about 3 sixteenths of an inch, uh, and they can hot roll steel from 10 inches thick in a plate mill. A new modern plate mill may cost you one or two billion dollars. Okay. Uh, the casting facility might cost you two or three billion, okay. Um, the uh, place where you make your cast iron might cost you two or three billion. A cold rolling mill will cost you one or one and a half billion. You put all this together to build a new steel mill will probably cost you fifteen to twenty five billion dollars. The last company built steel mill in the world that I know of was Bethlehem Steel Burns Harbor, almost bankrupt for Bethlehem Steel in the 1960s. Um, but by 1974, once Burns Harbor started high productivity, turning out steel, it was the best year Beth Bethlehem Steel ever had. They hired me and everything's been downhill since. Okay. Um, cold rolled is once you get down, uh, well you can hot roll in a plate mill and then you go to a strip mill or a, a uh, hot roll mill and you can go from about a half an inch down to three sixteenths of an inch while it's hot and it's coming out of there at sixty miles an hour coming out pretty fast cold rolling mill um, you go from three sixteenths and now it is thin enough and you can have big steel rolls made of higher carbon steel and you can get that stuff at uh, sixty miles an hour and you can go all the way down to foil not in those same big great big rolls that's another module that you won't take but you can cold roll the steel. This is where we make the automotive sheet. And in fact, the price of steel varies. The plate is going to be made in a hot roll mill, and the sheet will be made in a cold roll mill. mill. And the break point is basically plate is hot rolled and sheet is cold rolled, and bar is, can be either one. So this little half inch bar could be cold rolled, could be hot rolled, uh, it depends, okay. In the steel we have different structures. The alpha phase, which is body center cubic, is called ferrite, after ferrous. The face center cubic, which is non-magnetic, and most of your stainless steels are face center cubic, not all of them, is called austenite, after Roberts Austin, a British metallurgist of the 1890s. Then there is martensite, which is the hard stuff. You can transform the steel and make it extremely hard. 200 KSI strength for this file. Um, that's named after a French metallurgist named Martens, with an S. Uh, and bainite is named after a guy who did his research at U.S. Steel in the 1930s to understand how martensite formed. And in doing the research, he came up with another phase called bainite. Why are they all named ites? because the ability to measure the structure of the steel was invented by a guy, Henry Clifton Sorby, in the 1880s in Britain. He was, he was a geologist. And the geologists like to polish stones, and they get these beautiful pictures in color using polarized light and things like that. Well, Sorby, being a geologist, when he would see these different phases, he would name them ites because he thought of them as minerals, okay? And so that's how they got their names. You can take the steel, um, you can take a piece of this medium carbon steel, you can heat it up into the FCC region, you can quench it in water or in, in oil or sometimes in lead, molten lead, and you can transform it to martensite. It won't transform to ferrite, it'll transform to martensite which is not a cubic structure, it's body centered tetragonal, it traps the carbon in there, becomes extremely hard, okay? Just like the nail file, and also becomes very brittle. One of the reasons we like to um, use lower carbon steels for welding and stuff and structures is because we don't want to get too much of this martensite, which can be very hard if you keep it at a low carbon content, um, you can control the hardness. This is hardness. 
called Vickers hardness. You just take a hardness, you just have a controlled indenter. Uh, there's like a hundred different, well, not a hundred, there's probably 50 different types of hardness tests. Vickers has been around for a hundred years. Rockwell's been around for a hundred years. Those are two of the most common types of hardness tests. But you just have a little steel ball or a little diamond and you press it into the steel or the aluminum or the copper or whatever your steel alloy is or plastic. We do hardness tests on plastics. We do them on rubbers. You press it into the surface and you measure how deep it goes. And the deeper it goes, the softer the material for a given force that you're pressing on. It's not a very sophisticated test, but it's used all the time in industry because it's cheap and quick. If you look at the hardness of steel versus the carbon, if you quench it and temper it, you can get strengths here. Well, these strengths would be like 300 KSI at 900. You can just sort of divide this by, by three and get KSI. Not exactly, but close. Hardness Rockwell C, there's equivalence. So that nail, that file is probably about Rockwell C 60, 55 or 60. So it's uh, about, it's over 200 KSI, okay? Whereas if I cool it slow, I can get a perlytic stru structure if it's air cooled. If I cool it very slow in a furnace, I can get things even softer, becomes very formable, very malleable, okay? So I can change the structure of the steel by the way I heat treat it and by the carbon content that I have, okay? Uh, so there's quenching and tempering. In the old days, uh, some of the first steel that people ever had was basically meteoric iron, okay? They'd find a meteor somewhere, and someone found if you hammered it, you actually could, it was malleable. And then someone found if you heated it up in a, in a fire and you quenched it, it would become brittle, but it would become extremely hard. Um, and then they found if you tempered it, you could get some of the ductility back. You might lose a little bit of the hardness, but the best swords around thousands of years ago might be made of meteoric iron. Well, there wasn't a lot of meteoric iron, so only the kings had the meteoric iron uh, things. But they did have wrought iron, and they learned how to make swords. And of course, uh, uh, during the Crusades, the best quenching, the one that gave it the, the the, I don't know what it gave it, but they used to take a living slave and they would quench the hot steel by running it through the slave, okay? It gave it the, the quality to kill, I guess, I don't know. Uh, a lot of little things that you know people did in the old days that they don't do anymore. Um, okay, now, it, it can, the steel can be annealed like the spheroidized arm, iron. And so this one's dying, let's see. Should have a third one here. So I'll change the batteries. No, this one. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I thought I had the third one. Okay, so you can anneal it like the spheroidized iron, so it's very soft. You can normalize it where you heat it up and air cool it back down and get a very fine grain size to your steel. And that improves both toughness. Fine grain size is one of the only things that improves both toughness and strength at the same time. Usually you add alloying uh, elements and stuff and things get worse, okay, in terms of toughness. Uh, you might get strength with alloying elements, but you lose toughness. Uh, a commodity type material like bicycle tubing might be a 4130 steel, the 4000 series, well, the, the 1000 series, you might have heard of a 1010 steel or a 1020 steel. That's just low carbon steel. An alloy steel would be something like 4130. HY80 would be a, a 4000 series type steel if it had an AISI number. It doesn't have a US Navy number, HY80. Um, but bicycle tubing, you can buy it quenched and tempered. And 4130 bicycle tubing, this is thin wall tubing. It's also sometimes called aircraft tubing. If you build your own little plane, airplane frame, um, you make it out of the same 4130 stuff and you can TIG weld it. <coughs> And you can get quenched and tempered up to 120, 130 KSI. You can buy it annealed at about 80 KSI, and you can buy it normalized to about 100 KSI with the alloying elements. So the alloying elements add some strength, but you can get a whole range of strengths depending on the heat treatment. Um, you have your carbon steels, which traditionally, when Andrew Carnegie was selling to the railroads, uh, carbon steels were the cheapest. Alloy steels would cost a little bit more. Um, we don't have that kind of, we still call them carbon steels and alloy steels for historical reasons, but I'll get into the alloys a little bit. 
iron carbon alloys, but people found that just straight iron and carbon wasn't good enough in the 1870s and 1880s, particularly in Europe, where they had a lot of phosphorus in their steel. And they had a fair amount of sulfur, which came from the coal, quality of coal. They didn't have the really low sulfur coal that you could get out of Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, so the United States could make pretty good steel, but the Europeans were having problems. And someone found if they added some Spiegelisen, which is a German name for a iron manganese ore, which had a lot of manganese in it, they would no longer have this problem with the sulfur. Um, and so sulfur in steel can be a real problem because it forms a liquid iron sulfide. And you end up with not a solid piece of steel, but you end up with something that's sort of like a slurpy. It's got a liquid at the grain boundaries, an iron sulfide liquid. So you want to think of a snow cone or a slurpy, and you try to roll that, just think of rolling a slurpy. It sort of cracks up and falls apart. And that wasn't very good, okay? But people learned that you put manganese in steel. Now, a few years ago, um, some attorneys in the United States were trying to go after the welding industry because if you were to breathe 100% manganese, we've known this since the 1790s, people who worked in manganese ore mines would get something that looked sort of like Parkinson's disease. They would get uh, a nervous disorder. We've since learned, actually some people at Mass General did some of this work, um, that it attacks a different part of the brain. Okay, but if you get too much manganese, um, then you can uh, get a neurological deficit, which is permanent, and it's sort of like Parkinson's disease. Um, most Parkinson's disease is called idiopathic, which means they don't really know what caused it. They did prove that some of the drug addicts in California ended up with Parkinson's disease from overdoses on drugs, certain drugs. And so all of a sudden people said, oh, chemistry, chemicals are causing Parkinson's disease. And so that was in the 60s and 70s. So by the 80s, attorneys decided, ah, oh, the manganese and steel is causing people to get Parkinson's disease. You have to understand that about 20, 30% of the populace, by the time they turn age 80, will have some sort of essential tremor. 30% of us are gonna start shaking by age 80, okay? Um, it's just part of aging, okay? Well, they finally proved that manganism, which is a neurological deficit caused by too much manganese, is, uh, can, is, is it, it attacks a different part of the brain than Parkinson's disease, but the steel industry was spending over a hundred million dollars, not the steel industry, the welding industry was spending over a hundred million dollars in legal fees a few years ago to defend themselves against what would be 100,000 cases of all these welders out there who, you know, 20 or 30 percent of them, when they get older, are going to develop essential tremor. And the attorneys were saying, oh, oh, this is caused by welding. It's not caused by welding, okay? And they finally proved it, and they finally settled all of them, and all the plaintiff's attorneys went to find something else to do with their life. Um, many of them had started out in the asbestos business, um, so far as that goes. Um, just one of the wonderful things about our system. Um, actually, although I, I was, I actually helped defend the welding industry on those back in the 90s. I was in Danville, Illinois, and uh, uh, manganese actually is essential for health too. I mean, it, you ha you go to you go to take food supplements, go to some pharmacy, and they will sell you manganese pills. Okay, now. If you get a big overdose, like 50 or 100 times as much, you can start get manganese poisoning. Uh, just like you can get ice cream poisoning if you eat too much. If you ate 50 pints of ice cream every day, you would get ice cream poisoning. Um, but so anyway, they wanted to the the uh, defense or the plaintiff's attorney. And I'm on the witness stand. The plaintiff's attorney says, "Well, Dr. Eager, do you know how much manganese Mr. Siddons would have breathed in a day?" And I said, "Oh, it's about to quit." eating a handful of raisins. He says, excuse me? I said, you know those little red boxes of raisins you put in your lunch should be about equivalent to eating a box of raisins. He says, excuse me? At which point I just unloaded on him on how <laughs> manganese is essential for health and, most of, and we don't have a, a minimum daily requirement for manganese because it's in most of the foods we eat naturally. 
and you don't really need to take supplements, folks, unless you have a really weird diet. Like one kid I was in the infirmary with, once a student, he, he lived on M&Ms and Coca-Cola. If that's your diet, you probably need some manganese. Um, but I don't know, I have to find out how much is in chocolate. I don't think there's a lot in Coke. Um, but anyway, green leafy vegetables, uh, fruits and nuts, um, uh, nuts, dried fruits, Anyway, I rattled off four or five things that are health foods, basically, <laughs> okay, that have manganese. And at the end, he says, objection, Your Honor. And the judge says, you're objecting to your own question? What he meant to say is uh, uh, not objection, but uh, he wanted, uh, anyway, move to strike. He should have said move to strike, but he said objection, okay. He could have asked to strike my testimony as being non-responsive, but he said the wrong thing, and everybody in the courtroom started laughing at him. It wasn't my joke. It was the judge's joke. Um, but anyway, um, he lost that case. Now, so let's finish up here with this. You still see a few bubbles, but if I shake it, you see more bubbles, fine bubbles. So there's still CO2 in here. If this was a weld, there would still be hydrogen in there after an hour, okay? Be less hydrogen, I can't get as much as I had in the very beginning, but it's still there and I can nucleate those bubbles by shaking it because I create pressure waves and the pressure waves help, help with the nucleation. But in any case, we don't have to go through nucleation and growth. Um, remember that because we will start talking a little bit about uh, hydrogen embrittlement tomorrow. And after we talk a little bit about hydrogen embrittlement, we'll have a couple of presentations. And that's it for today. Okay? Thanks.